My name is Christopher Smith, and John Rondini will be presenting as well. And um, as you see in the agenda here, there's going to be nine topics, and there, there are kind of nine provisions that can come up in, in IP uh, agreements, et cetera. And the idea with this presentation is it's kind of like, I view it as like nine mini presentations within this larger presentation. So it's going to be, you know, four or five slides for each presentation. Don't worry if one of these topics kind of bores you or, or uh, maybe isn't, uh, you know, you're as interested in it, you know, it's going to change quickly. So hopefully there's something in here for everyone. And John and I will be kind of going back and forth a little bit here to, to mix up the presenters. So with that, we're going to start with marking provisions. And so just to start here, I'm sure a lot of you know, you know typically there, there are two main ways in a patent case you give notice for damages. There's actual notice where you send a letter that says, you know, you infringe patent X. And then there's what's called constructive notice or marking. And typically a duty to mark comes up when a patent owner has a product that's covered by the patent that it owns and, and they mark can, and that product you know is tangible and can be marked with the patent numbers. And in those cases, the law says that you have to substantially, consistently and continuously mark the products or you risk losing pre-suit damages if you ever enforce the patent because you haven't given proper notice. And that's typically, you know, when we typically discuss it, we're talking about the patent owner. However, the law also says that if you've got a licensee who makes a product under a patent in which it's licensed, that those same requirements are going to apply. So you could be a patent owner that doesn't make anything, but you, you license your patent rights out to a, an entity that does, and that entity's marking and or failure to mark can be imputed on to you if you later uh, look to enforce your patents. And, and, and obviously, if, if there's a failure to mark, then that can be imputed to you in a negative way and, and, and affect your damages. Now, so with this respect, as a patent owner, if you have a licensee, what kind of activity or actions does a patent owner have to take to ensure maybe or to try to avoid, I guess, the worst case scenario, which would be a licensee fails to mark when there was a duty to and then it gets imputed onto you and you lose pre-suit damages? The law talks about that looking at the middle bullet here, when the failure to mark is caused by someone other than the patentee, i.e. a licensee, the court may consider whether the patentee made reasonable efforts to ensure compliance with the marking statute. So the, the law has talked about a reasonable effort standard. And it's key to know here that, that the burden of proving that this requirement was met is going to be on the patentee, the patent owner. So, moving on. One of the ways in which entities have, have looked at and, and patent owners have looked at trying to um, accomplish this reasonable effort standard with licensees is to include marking provisions and licensing agreements in which the licensee is required to mark. However, and, and I cite this K&K Jumpstart case up here because it's kind of a, a warning, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're all good just because you have a marking provision and that was the case in K&K Jumpstart where the K&K had licensed this 407 patent to a company called Century um, and under that agreement, there was a, a marking provision. And beyond having that marking provision, K&K made no real effort to ensure that Century was actually falling through on it. Then K&K got into a lawsuit with a company called Schumacher. Schumacher raised the issue, claimed that there was no pre-suit damages because of Century's failure to mark. And at that moment, then K&K realized they had a problem, and they started to try to communicate with Century. And um, Century said, yeah, they got us. We hadn't marked. You know, there had been a delay in marking. And the Federal Circuit agreed with Schumacher's argument and said, look, we're not going to say that absolutely that a marking provision by itself can't meet this standard of reasonable efforts. But in this case, there had been no, nothing besides just a kind of a plain vanilla marking uh, requirement uh, provision in the license. And that by itself wasn't going to be sufficient. So with that issue in mind, what, what do you do to help guard yourself if you're a patent owner and you have a licensing uh, licensee and you want to make sure that you know their failure to mark isn't going to be a problem for you in the future? And from the K&K Jumpstart case, we know that that potentially the simply having a provision in there that requires marking probably or may not get you there. But there are things you could do that could at least hopefully um, make it easier to show reasonable efforts and hopefully move the, the ball along as far as getting a licensee to mark. And so here are a couple suggestions that we, you know, have uh, looked into as, as possibilities, such as 
include reporting requirements in the agreement where the licensee has to report to the patent owner of their marking activity. It keeps it in the mind of the licensee and it, and it gives the patent owner information in which to act on if they're not. Obligate under the license that the licensee must reject goods that aren't marked. You know, that puts another provision into the agreement in the marking context, which, which could potentially lead to a breach if the licensee is not following through and it keeps it again fresh in the mind of the licensee. Kind of the, the theme of all the case law is, is for showing reasonable effort, stay in constant communication with the licensee about their marking activities uh, so that you can demonstrate reasonable efforts later if you ever get in litigation. Be prepared to enforce the marking provision. And kind of my out of the box idea is consider a warranty provision in the agreement where the licensee says, effectively agrees that if their failure to mark causes you in subsequent litigation to lose damages, they're going to reimburse you for the loss of damages that was caused specifically for their failure to mark. So in the K&K case, Century would, would have to reimburse K&K for the lost damages for their failure to mark, even though they had agreed to under the license. So there's some thoughts in mind on marking. So with that, John is going to talk about grant provisions. So the, the grant clause is basically the keystone of any patent license. It outlines precisely what rights the licensor is granting to the licensee under that agreement and it's also meant to clarify which rights are not being granted. An IP license includes usually several types of different types of grants of rights depending on what the party's needs are. These may vary as well depending on the IP laws that apply to that agreement. So up here we have two different statutes. One's the patent statute, the other one's the copyright statute. And the rights under the patent statutes are the rights to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, selling, and importing the patented invention. Here, the patentee's rights are a negative one, and that means that the right, that's the right to exclude others from participating in those activities. Similar, under the copyright statute, the license is also a negative one, as it excludes others from reproducing, modifying, making derivative works, or distributing the copyrighted work. Uh, one important note on the grant clause is it has to be a present one. And what I mean by that is that the grant, you want to grant the rights now. You don't want to promise or agree to grant them at some point in the future. For instance, you don't want to use licensee agrees to grant. That, that would be something that is not a present one. Instead, you want to have more definitive language like licensee does grant. And that will allow the uh, license to contain the present at the moment type of grant language that you'd want to have in this type of uh, a scenario. With respect to grant clauses, you could have um, expanded rights that could be interpreted based on the contract, and, and there's two types. One is uh, expanding what are, what are considered upstream rights. Uh, one example in the copyright area is the right to use. So going back to the slide, here we have uh, a copyright case where uh, Kennedy versus the National Juvenile Detention Association, or NJDA. And here, the plaintiff, Kennedy, had worked with the NJDA to develop a report. And he had signed an agreement with them that he had granted them a license to reproduce, publish, and use any materials that he created. Well, later, the NJDA took his report and gave it to another party, and that other party formed a derivative work, basically took his work and, and continued on it and, and presented another report. Kennedy came back and said that was not proper, it was his copyrighted work, and so therefore they did not have the right to reproduce it, publish, or use it. Unfortunately, here the district court found that under the terms of the agreement was uh, giving derivative works to the NJDA so that the NJDA could give his report to somebody else and they could take that work and create a derivative work of it. Another type of upstream right is the what are considered the foundry rights. What foundry rights are, they are rights for the licensee to manufacture the licensed product for third parties to sell under that third party's name. And here, these are a type of rights that if you are granting them, you should really call them out in the grant clause and make sure if you don't want to have foundry rights that you're expressly calling that out as well. For instance, one of the cases in the, uh, the bullets below, the Cyrex case, Intel had argued that IBM was improperly um, using the foundry rights and giving Cyrex the ability to manufacture uh, unlicensed products. But here the court found that their contract language where it said make, use, lease, sell, and otherwise transfer IBM licensed products was not limited to IBM licensed products. 
and it did not exclude foundry rights. So Cyrex was allowed to continue the manufacturing under the IBM slash Intel uh, agreement. Now with respect to downstream rights, one of the uh, big cases is Corbrace. And here the have made right that was talked about in Corbrace refers to the licensee's right to engage a third party to manufacture a licensed product on the licensee behalf. And in Corbrace, the Fed Circuit had found that unless specifically stated otherwise in the grant clause, the right to make, use, and sell a licensed product, product also includes the implied right to have those licensed products made by a third party. So in other words, licensee need not participate in manufacturing at all and can engage others to do all the work connected with the production of the article for them. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Chris to talk about post-expiration royalty provisions. Thank you, John. So the post-expiration royalty uh, law kind of came to us through two Supreme Court decisions, one in the 1960s and one recently in 2015. The general concept is that if you have a license agreement um, or a settlement agreement it's with, with a royalty in it which extends beyond the term of the patent, the expiration of the patent, that <clears throat> at least for that time subsequent to the um, expiration of the patent, that is unlawful. And so the first case that came up uh, with this issue came up was Brulat, and that case involved hot picking machines where there was a license involved that extended beyond the term of the patents. The licensee defended on the, the concept of misuse because it was extending the rights of the patents beyond its term. And the court agreed and held unlawful per se. As you see at the bottom here, not all commentators necessarily agree with the ruling. Um, that perhaps it's not that a, a license or a royalty rate necessarily goes beyond the expiration of the patent, but it may be that it's just that the, the parties intend for um, not necessarily the monopoly, but they've altered the timing of the royalty payment itself. But, but the Supreme Court rule in Brulat was typically, if 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 on the the face of the the license, the the royalty could be would extend beyond the expiration of the patent, that that's going to be improper. And then fast forward to 2015 in Kimball, this issue came up again with respect to these uh, webcasting toys for Spider-Man, and uh, again there was a three percent royalty rate which extended. Uh, unlimited, no end date. And in that case, Marvel uh, sought declaratory judgment that that obligation to pay the royalties again ended at the expiration of the patent in view of the Brulat decision. And the Supreme Court agreed, applied stare decisis, uh, holding that Brulat really wasn't um, expressly unworkable. Congress hadn't stepped in over that, what, 50 years to, to fix the issue if it thought that there was a problem with the Brulat rule. And frankly, there was an expectation in contract uh, drafting and, and contract enforcement that that rule from Brulat was going to apply to subsequent agreements and they didn't want to disrupt that. So with those cases in mind and that you know that's the law of the land, what can be done to um, avoid the issue? And so when drafting uh, royalty rates and royalty agreements and licenses, there's a couple considerations to, to try to avoid this issue, particularly if the, 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 the term left on the patent maybe just isn't long enough to cover the royalty you want to, to uh, collect. Um, and so we'll start with the second bullet here first. So, so one way possibly to have a royalty agreement which extends beyond the expiration of a particular patent is to include additional rights in that agreement beyond that patent, such as, and I've got some examples here, maybe some copyrights, tr trademark rights, maybe there are other patents, trade secret rights. Maybe it's more of a business consideration like consultation or know-how or some kind of joint venture where effectively the extended royalty rate royalty can be justified by other means besides just that patent. However, if that was a route that was considered, the recommendation would be to include some language in the agreement where it's expressly stated that the, the royalty in some way may be stepped down some, some amount to account for, for the expiration of that patent so that it's clear under that agreement that uh, the patent owner is not getting some additional rights or some additional value out of the patent after it's expired to be consistent with the Supreme Court decisions. The last bullet here I think is probably the best idea because um, typically maybe you don't want to give up a lot of other rights or maybe that it's not a, a conducive to that. But the Kimball, Kimball decision actually talks about this in some form that you know if it's expressed on, a, on the language of the, the license that there's a royalty and it never ends then that's going to be a problem. However, there are circumstances where you could expressly put in the agreement uh, 
that the royalty payment will be delayed beyond the expiration of the patent. So maybe patent has a five-year term remaining, um, but, but the agreement says you're going to get paid for that five years of licensing over 10 years. So, it's a, so in that case, the parties, there's a meeting of the minds that they expressly agree to paying royalties on pre-expiration licensing post-expiration to spread it out. So that's, that's some crafting to, to kind of get the same result without having, running into the problems of Brulat and Kimball. Of course, the, and going back to the first bullet here for a moment, the other option is, if this is possible, feasible, is if you have a certain target in which you want to collect on the um, royalty, set the royalty rate high enough that you accomplish it by the expiration of the patent. However, often that's not going to be feasible, and that's why these other options are there for you to, to try to work it in within the brulat Kimball rule, but still get the uh, royalty that you would hope to accomplish in the agreement. That, uh, John's going to talk about best efforts and shall provisions in agreements. So in the next couple of slides, to what Chris just said, I'll be talking about best efforts and shell provisions. But essentially what these next couple of slides are supposed to go through is, is vague terms that can cause business misunderstandings and legal disputes. And, and there's many of them that could potentially affect an agreement, especially in the, in the IP space. But best efforts and shell provisions are, are two of the most notorious ones. Going to the first slide here, the, the best efforts provision. Uh, generally when the best or when the phrase best efforts is used in IP contracts, the party believes it's the most onerous of effort standards. And typically they take it to mean that a party held to that standard should do anything and everything it can to accomplish an ultimate goal. Unfortunately, uh, that's not always the case. Uh, for example, if, if the agreement said the supplier agrees to use commercially reasonable best efforts to satisfy the requirements of buyer for manufacturing widget X. What is the efforts the supplier is agreeing to satisfy? And, and here, it really comes down to the rest of the language, and it, it's a fact dispute. Courts have held that these types of obligations are very fact dependent. What courts have come out and said is bef best efforts uh, does not mean a party is obligated to do any of the following, uh, expend any material funds, uh, take actions which would result in a material adverse change in benefits, uh, incur any other material burdens, uh, so on and so forth through these bullets. Uh, so if you want a supplier to do any of these, uh, for instance, expend their own material funds, that should be expressly stated in the agreement. Don't just assume that the term best efforts will cover these. And never assume that the word best effort will be broad enough to cover obligations that, do that are not expressly written in the agreement. So some cases that have looked at the term best efforts with respect to IP agreements. Uh, the first one is Olympia, which was a Seventh Circuit decision. And there the best efforts clause under Illinois law uh, was found that a party to perform at the same level as it did in parallel contracts where its efforts have not been questioned. Uh, there is a case out of the First Circuit where the term best effort uh, does not mean every conceivable effort. So if you're going to use the term best effort, you should just understand it typically does not mean every possible effort. And you should try to avoid the best efforts clause unless you really need it because courts have found the provision to be impermissibly vague and, and indefinite. Um, if you do want to use it, uh, like I just stated, you want to list some exemplary activities that will help uh, solidify what you mean by the best efforts. Without that, it's probably going to be held to the more vague standard. And the other thing is you want to use the efforts clause consistently. And what I mean by that is if you have a supplier and buyer uh, of a software license agreement and a related software implementation agreement and you use best efforts clause in one agreement and commercially reasonable efforts clause in another agreement, there's going to be ambiguity there and it will be unknown what what the level of effort is supposed to be for both agreements, not just for one of them, because you're using two different terms that are vague on their own. So now you're using them in two different agreements, and it's become even more of a vague term. One of the other more ambiguous uh, terms that have, comes up a lot in contracts is the shall. And shall, most people assume it means must, but it has been found and been held that it doesn't mean must, and it could mean may, will, or should. So it's one of these terms that 
when you see it in the contract, you should probably try to avoid it and replace it entirely with more clearer words, such as must, will, is, may. Any of those would be more definitive and will be more clear in the agreement as opposed to shall. With that, I'm going to turn it back to, uh, to Chris to talk about exclusive licensee provisions. Thanks, John. So exclusive license provisions come up a lot because there are two general ways in which typically a an entity, a party, has standing to sue in a patent infringement uh, litigation. And, and typically, the, the obviously, the owner, the assignee of the patent owner, or the patent will typically have standing. And the exclusive licensee will have standing to sue, at least in the, ter- in the territory in which they have exclusivity. However, in the exclusive license context, there's at least two kind of variations of exclusive licenses that we're going to talk about today. One being kind of your traditional exclusive license where, met, where exclusivity is provided in a territory, um, but maybe not a lot of other rights. Uh, a lot of rights are still retained by the patent owner, and in those cases, the patent owner will, will be joined to the lawsuit. And then there are what I call the virtual assignment or the all substantial rights exclusive license, which in, in, in certain circumstances, an exclusive licensee can actually have staying to sue by themselves without joining the patent owner. Of course, in the third bullet here, uh, under no circumstances would a non-exclusive licensee by itself have staying to sue. So first talk about what I call the limited exclusive license. It, it could also be called traditional exclusive license, uh, a non-all substantial rights exclusive license, uh, whatever you'd like to call it. But the key here, you know, the, the, the language has kind of been blessed by the, the federal circuit as, as what leads to this exclusive status is that the agreement has an express or implied promise that others shall be excluded from practicing the invention within the territory. And so kind of the first like, tip here, I guess, is if the goal is to have exclusivity in a, in a license, in a provision, you want to in some way express this concept of exclusivity, promise to exclude in the territory. In this limited license, as I said, that, that promise is made, but not necessarily other rights are, are made, are, are transferred from the patent owner to the licensee as, as well, like the right to sue and the things, you know, the, the exclusive right to sue and things like that. Um, and that's why the patent owner must be joined in these types of exclusive licenses. One, to protect the alleged infringer from being sued twice, both by the exclusive licensee and the patent owner. And second, to protect the patent owner's right to be part of the lawsuit because they have some significant rights still at stake, like, say, the, being there to defend the validity of the patent. Moving on to what I call the virtual assignment or the all-substantial rights exclusive license. In this case, the law talks about all substantial rights being transferred from the patent owner to the exclusive licensee. That's not to say that ownership's transferred, but that the license, because the rights are so great that have been transferred, it effectively uh, functions almost like a, somewhat like an assignment. And the Mann case here cited by the Federal Circuit is kind of a key case that discusses the factors that go into determining that. And what that case tells us is that the kind of primary right you're going to look at, the key right in determining whether the all substantial rights are going to be uh, considered transferred is, is what rights in litigation has the patent owner retained. So if the goal is to have an exclusive license which would effectively give that licensee the right to sue in their name alone, you would want the patent owner to in the license to effectively assign the rights in litigating the, you know, the sole rights in litigating the patent to the licensee. And man has a, a nice discussion about all these different factors to consider. However, just because key rights like the right to sue are transferred doesn't mean that all rights have to be transferred for this type of virtual assignment situation to exist. The Luminar decision here talks about some rights that a patent owner could retain, yet it still be considered this kind of all substantial rights exclusive license, such as the patentee, the patent owner retaining the right to practice the invention, to have a financial interest in the litigation, not control the litigation, but receive payment from the litigation, to maintain title to the patent, to be responsible for maintenance fees, and to be involved, to have notice in the litigation. Again, not not having control, but just being provided notice that there's going to be lawsuits or, or licensing activities. And so why, why does this um, possibly matter? So so one case that, that I, I go back to a lot on this issue, because it can be very relevant to corporations, particularly um, with their IP, is the Spine Solutions case. And so, as I'm sure a lot of you know, you know, it's not all, you know, these large companies, it's often that they'll have multiple entities. You'll have practicing entities, you'll have non practicing entities, holding companies, if you will, often that hold IP. And, and that was some of the situation here in Spine Solutions, where there was a lawsuit, and, and this entity, Synthes Spine, was part of the lawsuit. It was a practicing entity, 
And there was a dispute whether Cynthia Spine actually had standing to be in the lawsuit because the only basis for its presence in the lawsuit was what it had called an understanding was with its sister company that actually had rights, ownership rights in the patent. And the evidence that was presented in that case wasn't an agreement or something between the two entities. It was merely testimony that within the structure of this SSI, Synth Spine Solutions conglomerate, that there was an understanding between entities that, that for this particular patent, Synth Spine would be the only entity practicing the patent, and SSI would not allow others to practice it. Would, you know, but, but again, there was no written agreement, no, oral, no evidence of oral or written agreement that actually stated that. No, no, they stated that promise that we talked about with regard to the right height case. And in this case, the Federal Circuit said that's not enough. If we were to hold this is enough, then basically just the fact that you're related entities in a conglomerate would be sufficient to deem exclusive licensee status, and that's not a rule they wanted to adopt. There needs to be something more. So the takeaway here is, is that early on, you get your house in order on this stuff. Make sure that you know which entity you want to sue, have the right to sue, and get express agreements between them where that promise is made so there's not going to be a standing question later because once you get to litigation and you file it, if that case is dismissed for lack of standing, you can't cure it later. It's a constitutional issue that can't be cured. So, so, so you want to make sure that the right entity has the standing. And the reason why is that, um, as you all know, there, you know, depending on which entity has the right to sue, that can impact what kind of damages you can get. You know, you, a practicing entity can seek lost profits often, where a non-practicing entity, you know, will typically be limited to a royalty. And also uh, for injunctive relief, um, it's hard to prove irreparable harm by a, a holding company. Certainly a practicing entity has a much larger claim to irreparable harm for purposes of injunctive relief. And so, if, and if anyone has any interest in this kind of concept of the standing issue with licensing and, 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 and particularly this holding company issue, there's an, an article uh, webpage that here at the bottom, uh, an article I authored a few years ago that was actually put in the ACC uh, website for uh, additional information in the man case. A lot of this case law cited in there as well. So with that, uh, John is going to talk about assignment provisions. Thank you. So with assignment provisions in the IP space, there's a, a lot of different aspects to it. One of it is the present assignment or promise to assign is one aspect. And here, the first case, uh, that, that's pretty a pretty big case, even though there's been a lot of commentary that the rule from this case shouldn't apply and it should be overturned, is the film tech case. 1991 case uh, from the Fed Circuit where they looked at the language do hereby assign in a contract. And what the Federal Circuit determined was that a contract that assigns potential future inventions from an employee inventor to an employer is an effective transfer of title of those future inventions to the employer. And since 1991, this has now been called the automatic assignment rule of future interest. So the magic phrase is hereby assigns or do hereby assigns when they appear in IP agreements or assignments is now interpreted as a present assignment of a future interest. So why are these important? Well, these, are, uh, these automatic assignments are pretty useful, especially uh, when you're talking about employers where you have employees that have a lot of migration as a fact of life. For instance, in the automotive industry, uh, employees, especially engineers, tend to uh, move from supplier to supplier. You know, in the present day, it's very common to have somebody only work at a company for five, maybe ten years. It's, it's very uncommon now that employees will stay at a company for their entire career. So having an automatic assignment within your agreements is a way to ensure that you can get present assignment for some type of a future invention or interest in, in the invention. And like I said, there, there's, there's lots of... Uh, negativity about this automatic assignment rule. Um, there's lots of comment, commentary that is wrong because it's not based on anything found in the Patent Act or anything in the common law of contract assignments. And in fact, in 2011, uh, Justice Breyer, Sotomayor, and Ginsburg criticized the film tech rule of automatic assignment. When it came up, it didn't come up as an issue in the case they were looking at, but it was a part of an agreement they were looking at for a different issue. But since it wasn't one that was uh, properly before the court, they couldn't overrule it. They just criticized it in their holding. The automatic assignment rule may not be around forever, but for now it is one that is still something that is held to be valid, and it's something that uh, should be used, like I said, in, in situations where you do have employees that migrate a lot. Another type of uh, patent assignment provision uh, was in the uh, Board of Trustees of Leland uh, Stanford Junior University versus Roche. 
Um, this is another twist on the assignment of inventions and employment contracts. And here, the Federal Circuit held that it's possible to assign an invention before it's created, and that such an assignment is effective over an existing agreement to assign in the future. So in this case, uh, doc Dr. Hollande was hired as a research fellow at Stanford University. And when he was hired, he signed Stanford's standard employment agreement that obligated him to assign his inventions to the university. About a year later, um, he then began working uh, with Sidious Corporation, which was a company that was later acquired by Roche. As a condition of his work with Sidious, the agreement stated that he will assign and does hereby assign to Sidious any right, title, and interest in each of the ideas, inventions, and improvements that may be devised as a consequence of his work. After this, he went back to Stanford and kept doing his work at Stanford, and on behalf of Stanford, they filed several applications which turned into continuations and divisional applications. And about 13 years later, in 2005, um, Stanford filed a patent infringement action against Roche. When the case was eventually appealed to the Federal Circuit, the language of both contracts was looked at, and the Federal Circuit found that Dr. Hollande agreed only to assign his invention rights to Stanford at an undetermined time in the future. But the Federal Circuit found that the Sidious Roche language was a present assignment of his future inventions. So the Federal Circuit, Federal Circuit concluded that Sidious immediately gained equitable title to all the inventions. So this is a situation of a second assignment being executed, which basically trumps the first assignment. So if you do have assignments in place, the, the key here is to know whether you're going to have a, a present or automatic assignment of the inventions that employees are, are coming up with. And the next slide just gives a couple of examples of certain languages and from the cases that do provide current or automatic assignments of rights of inventions. And, and the one from the Stanford case, I will assign and do hereby assign. You have the Film Tech Automatic Assignment Language, agrees to grant and does hereby grant. And then the third one is just a third case where it's agrees to and does hereby grant and assign. And this case was another interesting case. In this case, you had an employee, uh, David Barstow, who worked for a certain company, and he signed an employment agreement with them, and he agreed to and does hereby grant and assign title and interest in any ideas or inventions which relate to his employer's business which result from any task or work for his employer, or which relate to business activities of his employer. So a couple of years later, Mr. Barstow, um, being an inventive software engineer, went out and developed a software simulation baseball program. And the company he had been working for, he was working for a computer scientist, just to develop uh, and control, record data measured by sensors uh, for oil wells. So those two don't seem to be that closely related. So he filed his patents. He talked to the uh, patent attorneys at the company he was working at, and, and they allowed him to file them. He formed his own company, DDB Tech, and he assigned all the patents to that company. Well, several years later, he then sued MLB Advanced uh, for patent infringement. And after the suit was filed, uh, his employer assigned all of its interests under the employment agreement, including any patents that it says that it owned, to uh, MLB advanced and granted it a retroactive license and the court dismissed the suit because it found that all the patents that he had filed under D D DDB tech uh, fell within his employment agreement and that his previously his previous company had validly assigned those companies to MLB uh, on appeal the Federal Circuit found the language does hereby grant and assign does automatically assign to his employer the patented invention so the key here is uh, when you're developing these employment agreements and you have these certain types of language like the DDB Tech or Film Tech or Stanford, you, you want to make sure that you have immediate or automatic present rights in the assignment and you want to make sure they're broad enough that they're going to cover uh, any potential inventions. So moving on, there's examples of language creating a promise to assign. Now these aren't present um, or automatic assignments. These are that are effective at the execution date of the employment agreement. Uh, but these are uh, <clears throat> instead uh, uh, types of uh, patent rights that may happen or promise to happen in the future. So in IP Venture, the Federal Circuit found that the employment agreement provision 
uh, as you see on the slide that states, I agree to disclose promptly to HP, comma, to assign them to HP, semicolon, and then the, while well, we, we put in some parenthetical here, it essentially says, and sign documents required to obtain patent protection. Well, this wasn't a present assignment, obviously. This is now a mere suggestion that in some time in the future, you will agree to assign uh, to your employer those rights. Uh, likewise, in Arcanid, the Federal Circuit found the language shall be the property of the client and all rights thereto will be assigned as merely an agreement or a promise at some time, time in the future to assign and not a present automatic assignment. So the key here is without a separate assignment agreement, Arcanid didn't own title to the contractor's invention. The last one we have on here, it doesn't fall as cleanly into the first two, which are, are just very clear cut, not present or automatic type of assignments. This is more of the classic version of a, a ready, fire, aim situation. Here, Abrex had thought it had purchased title to patents from AstraZeneca. But as it turns out, the patents were owned by subsidiaries of AstraZeneca. Because of the language found in the agreement, AstraZeneca couldn't transfer the patent rights of a subsidiary without the subsidiary executing separate assignments transferring those rights. So when Abrex had filed a patent suit, it didn't actually own the patents. Uh, it wasn't until eight months into the lawsuit that this slight mistake was found, and AstraZeneca did work diligently with its subsidiaries to get assignments executed, but unfortunately, it, it was too late. On appeal, the Federal Circuit actually held that you can't retroactively cure jurisdictional defects, and it dismissed the case. And so this is a situation where when you do have assignments, whether it's um, you know company to company or employee to employer, you want to make sure that you know what type of assignment you're getting, whether they be present or automatic or something that requires additional assignment documentation to occur. Uh, scope of the assignment. So what inventions will be covered by the assignment? Uh, one of the cases we have up here is Preston v. Marathon. And in this case, the employment agreement provided for assignment of inventions made or conceived during employment. Uh, in this case, Preston had argued that the invention at issue had been an idea which he conceived prior to the employment, so he was not required to assign it to Marathon. Uh, obviously, Marathon disagreed with him. They successfully rebutted this argument, stating that the language of the contract said, regardless of when it was conceived, the invention had been developed and thus, quote-unquote, made during his employment. And here, the, the Federal Circus agreed with Marathon. The, the language did cover made or conceived, and made means if he made it while working for Marathon, it's Marathon's property. So it was, you know, it didn't matter when he conceived it, essentially, as long as he made it while working at Marathon. And that gave broader assignment rights for inventions uh, of an employee that may develop something uh, after he's hired by a company, but something that he may have started conceiving or coming up with before he began working at the company. And just as a corollary, on the bottom here, we have another case, this a recore case. In this case, it was more of looking at the term conceive. And, and here, uh, recore, the defendant tried to argue that the word conceive within an employment agreement should have the same meaning as defined within the patent law. The district court disagreed, saying that would impose a higher standard of proving when an invention was conceived in the context of employment agreements, so it rejected that, that argument. So conceived when used in terms of IP agreements or IP assignments uh, does have a very, very broad meaning and using the made or conceived could gain you the extra benefit of an employee who developed something while being employed for you but possibly conceived it earlier. Just two additional considerations with a patent assignments are the holdover clauses or trailer clauses. And what holdover clauses and trailer clauses are um, is that you may have an employee uh, that came up with something or, or developed something after they leave typically. And the reason that these are, are found to be valid is usually they don't limit the employee's post-employment activities ex except with respect to the affected inventions or improvements on some invention they did work at work on while at the company. And what courts have found is typically these inventions, these post-employment inventions do relate back to something they were doing while working for the company they just left. So as long as they're valid in scope, I mean, you can't have a, a holdover clause be for the rest of the former employee's life, but typically a year is very standard for these type of holdover clauses. And it, it just 
ensures that if they come up with something in the following year, it's typically going to be related back to what they worked on. And if it's covered under the employment agreement, it's not a restraint on the employment <laughs> employee's trade after they left. It's just a, merely a vested ownership of an invention back to the entity that should have ownership over it. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Chris for most favored license terms provisions. Thank you, John. So uh, real briefly here, so the, the, the general idea of a most favored licensing term in an agreement would be something along the lines of, you know, I'm going to agree to a license with you, and in that agreement, um, if in the future you license with somebody else and those terms, some terms of that agreement, probably, probably primarily the royalty amount, is a better deal than what I got the kind of the original license licensee, or at least the one that got the the, the better uh, most favored licensing term provision. Then you have to honor that subsequent better agreement with respect to our relationship. And in theory, such a provision seems to protect the licensee and an early licensee specifically from a disadvantage of, of you know a later deal. However, in practice, a lot of these terms can, can, can actually lead to a lot of confusion and uncertainty and, and, and not be as um, efficient as, as hoped. For example, even though such a provision may be included in an agreement, it doesn't necessarily mean that a licensee is going to be aware of subsequent license terms. So that can lead to a problem with the licensee not actually knowing if they have a right or not to a, a better deal. And it may not always be clear about, you know, so if, if a subsequent license is entered into, Maybe some of the terms in that license are better than the original license, but others are not. So does, does this mean when you invoke this most favored licensing term, do, do all terms from the subsequent license be imported into the earlier license or just some of them, the better ones? Additionally, it's not always clear what can trigger it. Is it, is it limited to a kind of a like-minded license agreement or could settlement agreements, M&A transactions, or other types of agreements trigger that clause if, if there are certain terms in those agreements which are relevant to the original agreement. And as we're going to talk about in the next slide in more detail, what happens with lump sum royalty rates um, when a better deal is reached later? And so we're going to talk about the J.P. Morgan Chase case here. In, in that case, it involved J.P. Morgan Chase and Data Treasury. Data Treasury, um, many of you probably are aware, they sued a lot of banks in the kind of early 2000 to 2010 range. In that you know, range, particularly in 2005, where they settled a lawsuit with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. And in that settlement, there was a $70 million royalty paid that came out in quarterly installments. And that license agreed a most favored licensing provision. Fast forward seven years, Data Treasury entered into a new license with a company called Cafe. And under that agreement, it was a $250,000 lump sum. And there were, f and under that, each Cafe entity got $250,000. So I think the total amount of the payout was a million dollars. For the four entities, but J.P. Morgan Chase says, "Look, you know, we paid you seventy million. Now you've got this new deal with Cathay where you paid a million. You owe us a refund because we had most favored licensing terms, and, and under that we should be entitled to the benefit of, of that subsequent lower licensing rate." And the court agreed with J.P. Morgan in order that Data Treasury provide a refund of the, I think I assume it was sixty-nine million dollars. And by the way, I would love to have been a fly in the room the day that that happened. I can imagine uh, being data treasury and, and having this order come down uh, seven years later. But the interesting thing about the decision was that under the facts, I mean, Cathay was a much smaller entity. The volume, uh, it was because the, the technology at issue was this, uh, I think it was check imaging software. And and uh, the check volume, the volume of transactions was much lower for Cathay than it was for, for J.P. Morgan, obviously. But the, the court said that doesn't matter because... It, they were lump sum agreements. So, so the other, under the agreement, you paid an amount and you got unlimited use, whether it was used it once or you used it, you know, 100 million times. And so, there, that wasn't going to be a distinction to allow Data Treasury to avoid the, the most favored licensing term uh, provision being triggered by the Cathay license. So, with that in mind, what, what are some considerations for these most favored terms to maybe bring some certainty to them? Um, if you want to use them and, and avoid some pitfalls. So, for example, this would be from the licensee standpoint, require the licensor to provide notice of future licenses so you can actually determine if there is a, a subsequent license that could trigger the clause. Require expressly in the agreement that, that what's going to trigger the clause are, are apple to apple comparison of terms. So you're not going to have, you're not going to have like very different types of licenses or types of agreements triggering the term. They've got to be similar licenses with substantially similar terms to trigger that. Otherwise, you know, it becomes very confusing on what triggers and what doesn't. 
Um, from a, a licensor standpoint, you know, especially in view of what happened with J.P. Morgan, it seems like the exclude the right to refunds of royalties paid. So if it's already been paid, in this case, J.P. Morgan already paid the, the 70 million, that would have been excluded if you had that kind of provision. And the one that I really like is the consider a sunset provision. And this makes a lot of sense to me because when you license early IP, it obviously has a higher value because it's newer. Ten years later, after the IP has grown older, typically at least, I think maybe some of the biotech might have a different opinion on this probably because those patents hold their value longer. But certainly in a lot of other technology areas, IP loses its value over time. And so it's going to make sense that you're going to maybe enter into licenses, you know, five, ten years down the road that are going to be less than an early license. But they're also getting less rights in that agreement because the term of the patent is getting closer to expiration. So if you sunset out the MFL provision, so, so a certain number of years, maybe it sunsets out before some of those later uh, agreements. Obviously, another option just don't use lump, lump sum uh, or don't use MFL provisions for lump sum agreements to avoid this issue or express the lump sum maybe in a different form like a royalty rate or something to avoid a complete refund if that comes later. And exclude subsequent uh, uh, settlement type agreements. You know, there's, there's some back and forth about whether settlement agreements uh, in the case law about whether settlement agreements actually trigger these anyway. But again, this gets back to the apple to apples. Like if it's a license, have a license have to be what triggers and not some kind of settlement agreement later. So with that, um, John is going to talk about NDA provisions. Thanks, Chris. So with NDA provisions, the most hot topic usually in NDA provisions is the restrictive covenants. And re restrictive covenants are designed to prevent an employee or individual associated with a company from revealing certain information about that company to competitors or possibly leaving the company and conducting business in direct competition with their former employee. Typically, these restrictions are necessary to prevent financial damage from occurring before an employee util utilizes that proprietary information in a non-proper way after they leave the company. So up here we have three bullets. We have the non-compete, non-solicitation, and non-disclosure type of restrictive covenants. And all three of these types are, are, have their own purpose of trying to prevent someone from taking something that uh, is a business, customers, employees, uh, or Proprietary, proprietary products, trade secrets, and uh, each one of them, you, you got to kind of look at them as their own. So the non-compete are difficult to enforce typically, uh, and several states have said they will not be enforceable because they restrain trade. Uh, so you, th th that type of restrictive covenant you have to look at because, like I said, certain states don't allow it. I know in Colorado, for instance, Typically, the non-competes not allowed, except there is a carve-out in the Colorado law where, it, you know, it may be applicable for trade secret violations. Uh, Non-solicitation agreements uh, means someone who leaves your company and then is trying to solicit or pick off your top engineers. So most times, um, that type of restrictive covenant is upheld. It is valid. It's not restraining trade. So that type of um, restrictive covenant in most states is allowable. And then you have the non-disclosure uh, type of agreement. And here, the non-disclosure confidentiality, confidentiality agreement is uh, typically designed to keep someone from talking about or stealing your proprietary information, your trade secrets, uh, your inventions, or, or giving somebody information uh, that would give them a competitive advantage over, uh, <clears throat> over you. Uh, again, non-disclosure agreements, like your non-solicitation, uh, typically don't restrain trade in, in most states uphold the non-disclosure agreements. Um, I don't think there's any states that actually don't uphold it. Uh, the non-compete's the only type of restrictive covenant where you really have to look at the, you know, the, the law in that state to determine whether or not um, it would be enforceable. <clears throat> so the key parts of, the, of an NDA, um, the first one is define the confidential information. And the definition of the confidential information can and should vary based on you know, that specific transaction. Uh, it's critical for every NDA to first clearly define the materials that should and should not be considered confidential. Uh, certain types of materials like uh, oral conversation, written notes, analysis, uh, documents produced with the use of confidential information. And, and you should really pay special attention and there should be a call out that considers trade secrets. And trade secrets should not be blurred with confidential information. If, you, if you're looking at a trade secret aspect, in a NDA, in an employment agreement, you should have that specifically called out separately from quote-unquote confidential information. But the term of the confidentiality, 
In addition to defining what you consider to be confidential or trade secret, the NDA should also clearly define a time limit for the agreement. The term can vary. I mean, I mean it could be one year, two years, five years, indefinite in some instances. But whatever the choice is, it should be critically and clearly defined. Um, you know, for most sellers, you want a longer NDA because that's better, especially when trade secrets are being disclosed. Uh, depending on the nature of the disclosing business, I mean, the trade secret can be just as critical in 25 years, 30 years, 50 years. I mean, in the case of Coca-Cola, they've been going with the same trade secret for close to 100 years now. So you want to secure that confidential information and the term. Uh, there, there's not a restriction on term. I mean, there, it depends on what you're talking about. Like I said, for trade secrets, the term can be um, open-ended. It doesn't have to be defined to a certain time limit. It's What you're looking for, though, you're looking to seek to protect and secure the confidential information for as long as possible. Uh, and the last one is the, uh, the permitted use. The permitted use is probably one of the trickiest clauses in the NDA. Um, this section is meant to provide clarity more times than not around the intended use of the confidential information. And for most NDAs, the confidential information is typically limited only for evaluation and negotiation of potential transactions. So, you know, if, if you're looking at talking with another company, possibly a supplier, or uh, possibly somebody you want to uh, sell your invention to, you might have some permitted use type of language in there so that they can come in, they can evaluate it, they can look at it, they can look at it for a certain time, certain scope, but they will still be bound by this confidentiality NDA. And, and, and these three types of aspects of your NDA you, sh you need to look at and these need to be evaluated and it shouldn't have some blanket NDA which you supply to everybody <clears throat> because how these three clauses, how these three parts of the NDA are defined and how they're used is going to be very fact dependent on and who's coming in and what you're disclosing. So choice of law issues. Just a couple of quick points on this uh, since I know we're getting close on time is enforceability of choice of laws is subject to challenge, especially when you're talking about multi-state scenarios. And it's, it's generally not uh, enforceable if you're trying to get a favorable choice of law. For instance, if you have an employee out in let's say Washington State and you try to have a choice of law of New York, the, the place of employment usually typically trumps and, and we have a Fourth Circuit case up here. Same thing with the transaction, where it occurs and the time of performance of where it occurs. So you can't just try to dictate when you have a multi-state scenario where you want the choice of law to be in certain scenarios. And one last final point is, and this kind of ties back to what we were talking about with the non-compete, is, is the California rule. It, it is a state that has very, very strict employment statutes, and one of them is the non-compete is void in California. So that, that you can't even have it there, and you can't try to circumvent it with an employee out in California and say, well, New York law trumps. Typically, California courts will, will find that that's not valid because for an employee of California, the California rule is going to apply. <clears throat> That I'll turn it back to Chris for the no challenge provisions. I know we're running short on time, so I will try to get through this quickly. Okay, so no challenge clauses. So the, the, the general concept here is that in certain agreements and in, in all various forms of IP, um, a, a licensor may include a provision that says the licensee cannot challenge the validity, the enforceability of the IP the, at issue. And what matters here is the context and the type of IP, um, whether that no challenge clause is going to be enforceable. So first, the kind of the non-patent types of IP, typically the no challenge clauses for copyrights is going to be valid. Trademarks, it's valid, and, and but in the context of this special certification mark type of, uh, uh, of situation, they've often been found to be invalid, the Second Circuit held in the Idaho potato case. Moving on to patent settlement agreements, patent agreements. So the general rule is, with the guy into the, into the, the bowels of the law, is that a pre-litigation agreement that has a no challenge clause in it is invalid because, and the, and the idea beyond, behind it being invalid is that in pre-litigation, you haven't really necessarily challenged the validity yet. And the, the law kind of holds as a public opinion is that at the time when you have a licensee situation, they have the most incentive to challenge the validity because they're paying a royalty. And so under the law, when the patent has not been litigated yet, typically a, a license agreement kind of independent of litigation is going to be invalid. The no challenge clause would be invalid. Flip to the other side, the situation where it's a post-litigation, like a settlement agreement basically, settling litigation. And in those cases, the law often has held that those types of no challenge clauses are valid. And, and the kind of the, the reasoning behind that is that, well, at that point, 
the licensee has had the opportunity to challenge the validity in a court, possibly with an IPR, possibly with summary. I mean, they've, they've done their prior art, they've done their due diligence on the validity, the enforceability of the patent, and they've reached the conclusion that they should sell. So in that case, that clause to not challenge is going to be held up. So with this in mind, are, you know, are there any alternatives to no challenge clauses in circumstances where they would probably be unenforceable? And some thoughts, though, as you'll see here, the ED New York, at least some courts have found maybe the, the, that uh, they're skeptical. But the thought would be maybe you, you have terms about a financial penalty if you challenge the validity, loss of exclusivity if you challenge the validity of the IP, maybe a termination even. And so these are provisions that you could consider in, instead of a, a no challenge clause in circumstances, mostly pre-litigation circumstances, where the no challenge clause may be invalid. Another, just a comment here, this last bullet here, and then I'll, I'll be done here. This came up in a case recently in NDCal, and I believe it's at the Federal Circuit now still pending. But there was actually a decision where the form selection clause came into to play, actually, in determining whether you could, and this is specific to IPRs now, but, but there was an issue where the form selection clause, you know, had specific, I think it was California jurisdictions. There was no mention of the PTAB as a potential jurisdiction uh, under the agreement. And the court held that uh, actually throughout the district court, throughout an IPR, and joined the defendant from challenging an IPR based on a, a previous agreement between the parties because the form selection clause did not include the PTAB. And so, and obviously, as we all know, the PTAB and IPRs is an, an often uh, a common location now for challenging validity of, of patents specifically. And so that's something else to consider. Now, how the Federal Circuit is going to ultimately come down on this, you know, we'll wait to see. But that form selection clause could have an impact on um, where, at least where you could challenge the validity. And with that, if there are any questions, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. And we are available for questions. Thank you very much, Christopher and John. I appreciate the excellent presentation and information. That's really, really useful. And I know your, your biographies and contact information are available on your website at Brooks. Cushman.com. I know we still have quite a few people who have stayed on after three. If I can ask just one kind of bonus question, what, what have you guys seen? And you could, could you tell us what your most common mistake, drafting mistake, or uh, thing that kind of irks you when you see it when, in, in IP agreements? Well, this is Chris, and I'll let John speak as, as well. But my, my opinion, and it may not be a specific like provision or term, but it, generally ambiguity is, is the biggest issue because you know I, I'm dealing with issues in multiple cases now where it's like, you know, there's a lot at stake over, you know, what did it mean? And, 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 and unfortunately, it seems to me that when these all types of agreements are negotiated, there's almost like the end game is like a shared ambiguity because both sides want to feel like they're right or that they, they got, you know, a good deal. And so to do that, you end up with amb ambiguous terms So because you got to – both sides almost want to feel like they, they won, I guess, the negotiation, right? So what often happens, I find, is just that the terms are ambiguous – and then later on, you have to clean it up. And so, you know, to just kind of like a, a general like thought as much as you can is think about, you know, if, if I ever had to get in front of a judge and litigate this this provision or this contract, do I feel like, you know, do I do I feel that the way that this is drafted at this point, I could I could defend it to the side that I want it to fall. So, I mean, that that to me is is a key point in general, like kind of a pet peeve. It's just it's just being too ambiguous with words. And John, if you have any. Yeah, I mean, I tend to fall into the same uh, camp. For me, it's 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 ambiguity, and that's that's why I did the the couple slides on a couple of phrases. I mean, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity, especially in the IP space. You know, one of my biggest pet peeves is is using the terms confidential information and trade secret interchangeably throughout the agreement. Uh, that adds and will add a lot of ambiguity as to what's the confidential information, what's the trade secret. Anytime you have certain phrases that you may have carried over from one contract and, and just try to carry it over to a new contract that tends to add a lot more ambiguity because then you're not really defining the intent of the the new parties you and, and whoever the new party is you may try to use certain clauses and you just say well this is just a standard one we've used in the past well the standard one used in the past doesn't really call out the technology doesn't call out the confidential information it may not call out what the trade secrets are i mean when you're doing these yeah you can start with a base one but your base one shouldn't look identical every single agreement. It, it should be a base that you start from. You should look at the the law that you're trying to apply, whatever state it may be. Maybe it's a certain NDA for a certain state. So maybe you have a certain a base NDA 
And from there, you're going to specifically define the terms of that NDA to Chris's point and get out the ambiguity so that when you're standing in front of a judge, you can say, you know, you've, you've looked at the law, you know that the law is on your side, and any ambiguity, you want it to be construed in your favor. So if you're going to try to make something a little ambiguous, I mean, look at the look at the cases, look at how the cases have come down and, and the language which has been upheld, which has been struck down in certain in certain jurisdictions, and, and try to get rid of some of this language where you know it's just not going to work out for either party. I mean, it's it's not beneficial, for example, to use the best efforts. It's just, and with the case law, there's just not.